Hello and welcome to a Traverse Stakes edition of Handicapping with Stats Race Lens. I'm Dan Torgman from America's Best Racing. Joining me once again is TVG's Christina Blacker and reigning NHC champion Scott Coles. In addition to being great people, they also both use Stats Race Lens in their handicapping. So we're going to be hearing from Scott and Christina, and we're going to be talking momentarily to them about what they've dug up using Stats that will inform some of their plays on Saturday at Saratoga. Behind the scenes, Ellis, Tom, Greg, let's kick things off and welcome in Christina. Christina, seven stakes races, six of them grade ones. Is there one race or one showdown that you're most looking forward to on Saturday? I think I'm looking forward to a lot of different races and a lot of different horses just as far as, you know, being a fan. Of course, the big one with the Travers. I want to see what Chancelot can do again just, as a racing fan to see what he can do. But I think as far as the handicapping goes, the Boston Spa, the Sword Dance, so I'm looking at the turf races as maybe your opportunity uh, to make a little bit of money in there if possible, specifically the Sword Dancer. Yeah, so that's that's the question, right? I mean, we might be looking forward to some of the races to see some superstars running, but then you're looking forward to some of the other races uh, as better betting races potentially. Scott, a futures trader, a data guy, no shortage of numbers to sink your teeth into in a card like this. What's your approach to handicapping the card and how does stats come into play? Um, well, I, I start with the, just scanning for angles that light up either red or green is the, is the easiest and stats makes it really easy with, you know, how bright that kind of just jumps off the page at you. Um, if you've got anything that either they provide or that you've had in the past, you can kind of use that, that as a starting point. And then um, I like to, kind of view the races and then create and back test my own angles. Um, luckily in trading, I have people much smarter than me that do that for me, but um, I'm able to do that uh, on this the best I can and come up with some, some stuff or some reasons why to, and it's so great that you can just back test an unlimited amount and they have, you just go to their database and it's, it's just, it's very cool. You just have to put the time in and then kind of just, uh, look at the true odds page and the race projection and I'm I'm more of a pace person so I, I use that and that, that kind of shows everything all in one page with the pace projector and the late pace pick the spots I like try to find some singles and then you know pick the tournaments that correspond and also whatever you know horizontal bets I'm more of a horizontal than a vertical player whatever horizontal bets line up and just kind of try to attack the right pool rather than trying to play everything right, that'll be the tricky part on Saturday, and we're going to dive into the card and take a look at some of the angles you've come up with. But just want to let everyone know before we start that to celebrate this spectacular Saturday at Saratoga, Equibase is offering a limited time discount of 30%, 30% off of all stats subscriptions. All you got to do is get on Equibase.com, pull up the package you want, and enter promo code TRAVERSE30, TRAVERSE, and then the numbers three zero. All right, so let's kick things off with race five on the card. The first stakes race of the card is the four go, and it features the return of Met Mile winner Matoli, who'd won seven straight races before being upset last month in the Vanderbilt. Circumstances, well, he didn't break well, faced pressure throughout, impossible fractions, and then, oh yeah, Imperial Hint broke a track record. So um, was not to be for Matoli on that day, but prohibitive favorite, of course, on Saturday in the Forgo, Christina, as I understand it, there's another horse that you've got your eye on in this race who could potentially pull, a mile, pull off a mile upset. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think just to touch on Matoli, you know, first of all, I watched the Vanderbilt a couple times, uh, you know, just kind of preparing for today. And I think looking at the Met Mile, I think that was his day. You know, horses are not machines, and as much as he has looked like a machine, I think that he might be one of those horses that just is going to need a couple races until he gets back to his best. I'm a big believer in bouncing and regression and patterns uh, along those ways if you're following any speed figure. So I think for Matoli, I think he's going to need another race or two just to kind of get back to his best. The comment line say that he hit the gate at the start in the Vanderbilt. I watched it so many times that I didn't see that it really hindered him from establishing an early position that he wanted. I think he was taken by surprise by Imperial Hint. The track was fast at that time at Saratoga. And again, maybe he's just on a downward pattern for a little bit. Not saying that he's not going to get back, but just not 100% on his day game right now. So the horse I'm going to try to beat him with is promises fulfilled. And he will break from the rail. And he is also very fast. And so I think the uh, 
sort of strategy is going to be pretty clear, and Dale Romans has always been very clear about that. If you want to take it to him early, it's kind of your own you know, suicide mission out there. And I was kind of fumbling around with the stuff and just curious. I was initially looking at Shackleford, but I stumbled upon his dam, Marquis Delivery, and her lifetime stats as far as her progeny in dirt sprints. And now I know that this horse has been dirt sprinting for a very long time, so it's not anything new. But it's just really remarkable. She has produced 38% lifetime dirt sprint winners. I mean, she's just incredible. And that Marquis cow gal that you're seeing there has picked up quite a few of those wins as has promises fulfilled a seven-time winner himself he loves saratoga he's two for two over the course there i think you can give him some minor excuses in the churchill downs in the met mile he did a bobble and stumble at the break i don't think he was going to beat matoli on those occasions but he's a horse that is at his best at saratoga i think he's catching matoli on maybe a weak pattern right now and perhaps Saturday will be the day that he can upset him and get the win. So I'll go for promise to still be five to two on the morning line. Hopefully you'll get something around that at plus time. I like it. My, my only concern with promises fulfilled is that, you know, thinking that he has to be forwardly placed, he's obviously a little bit of a disadvantage being down on the rail. He's going to get pressure from his outside from a couple of these. Um, one that I like in here uh, is one who had shown speed previously, but is, been a little more tactical of late, um, and that's the four horse, Killybeg's captain, 15 to 1 morning line. His form is a bit muddied by the fact that he's faced some adverse conditions and tough trips, but I think he's drawn optimally here so that if there is a pace duel that, that ensues between Promises Fulfilled and Matoli, that Killybeg's captain could potentially pick up a share from there. Uh, again, on paper, I agree with you, Christina. I think the two best horses are Promises Fulfilled and Matoli. Um, I also wanted just to show off a, a couple of features or just, you know, one of the search features here. Take a look at number two, Airstrike, who is going to ship in uh, for trainer Phil D'Amato. Uh, can't ignore the effort two back when he matched uh, the career best uh, Equibase speed figure, the 108, when it's lit up in green right there. That means that's a career best number for that horse that's going seven furlongs there in the triple bend. And if you click on the chart there uh, on the left, you click on the race, it pulls up the chart for you you'll see where uh, horses' names are circled uh, that three of the horses came back to be next out winners out of that race, including Sistron, who ended up beating Airstrike going six furlongs in the grade one Bing Crosby. There's also American Anthem, who won a nice allowance race last month, and Majestic Eagle, who came back and won a grade three. So here's this horse shipping in from California for Phil D'Amato. Does he do well when he ships horse in? Well, ships horses in to the East Coast. Well, I had no idea. So luckily with stats, it's pretty easy to find that info. All you got to do is click on Phil D'Amato's name right there. And then you do a data search. I mean, you could just do a quick search and use today's circuit specifically to see how he does when he ships to the East, East Coast. And you see the numbers right there. Not a very large sample, but he does have two winners. Those were back in 2016, though. One of them was on the turf as well, with obviously, but uh, he hasn't done it often. So um, it's one of those things where um, if you don't have a large sample, uh, you, you can make a decision as to whether or not to, you know, to, to throw it out throughout the search entirely or say, hey, you know, maybe he doesn't do it often. Maybe he does have confidence in this horse. Um, for me, the way I interpret this data is that if you like the horse, um, I, I, I'm not entirely discouraged, but if you don't like the horse, I, I could see you saying, you know what, it's been a while since he's shipped one to the East Coast and won. So um, that is further proof, you know, further reason not to uh, not to go with uh, airstrike. So I was kind of indifferent. I, I thought that potentially best case scenario airstrike could could run into a piece of it. Um, but I think I'm with you, Christina, uh, in, in identifying, I think, promises fulfilled as the biggest threat. Matoli, of course, I think is going to be really tough. Uh, Scott, just so we don't skip you, we'll let you kind of weigh in here. Matoli, promises fulfilled or or someone else? Christina made a good case, has me a little bit scared. I'm probably going to use them both because I'm getting pretty thin in most spots. But um, Matoli is probably who I'm going to use a little bit more just because of the draw. I think if they're reversed or promises fulfilled was way outside, I'd be a little more inclined to, to like that situation better. But I mean, promise is still going to have to go awfully fast to maintain the spot on the rail. And Matoli just might have a little more through the lane. But I, I agree the pattern and the balance and the decline. I mean, those are all issues. So I mean, I don't think this is, there's a lot of spots where I like to get really aggressive with only one horse. I don't think this will be one of them because there are concerns. But 
Um, I just think Matoli, if it's close going down in the lane, I, I think seven for long, I think Matoli will get it done. All right. Let's move on to race six. It's the Ballerina. And again, this one on paper at least shapes up as a two horse race between separation of powers and come dancing. Uh, however, the early footed come dancing may have the tougher assignment again uh, with a good amount of speed signed up to her outside. So similar dynamic here. Uh, does this set up better for separation of powers or is there another horse in here who can pull off an upset? Uh, Scott, I know you have a strong opinion in this race, so take it away. Um, I really like come dancing in this spot. Um, I guess I'm contradicting myself a little bit because of the, the same draw issue, but come dancing has, it's very versatile as one from on and off the pace. And I, I mean, I think, um, are we going to do the replay of the, of the Ogden Sips? It's a legitimate excuse. I mean, I think one, um, you got to stumble at the start. It's not terrible, but it's it's enough where the horse nose almost touches the ground. You've got to now rush up from the rail as the one horse. Um, surprisingly, one favorite that day. I cannot believe that that's like midnight. Beast. It was eight to five that day, but I mean, you have to do you have to do so much work and use so much with. Midnight Bisu, who is just unbelievable at a mile and a sixteenth, running at you late. That that will not be the case today. Um, thought did a did a great job to clear and and hold on for a second. I mean, he just ran into an absolute buzzsaw on Midnight Bisu at that distance. I mean, the horse is just unbelievable, um, and and she can finish. I don't think there's like anybody in here that can finish like that. Um, and I mean, you'll see, just holds on for. I mean, a good amount of the way and a good ride by Mike Smith to wait and time it perfectly like he usually does with Midnight Bisu, but um, you've got a lot of things going that we'll talk about after the race, but um, man, there's no Midnight Bisu's running at you late in this one, and I, I just think the horse has shown the ability to win on the lead and off, and I just love the versatile types that... Um, can use earlier can kind of sit right off. Mm -hmm. Scott, let me ask you a question as we're waiting for Midnight Bisu to make this move here. Um, when you're handicapping, when you're watching replays, um, do you hold it? I mean, how much of the fractions come into play or do you hold it against the horse at all? Because I, I, I'll admit, I do. Like when I look at Come Dancing, even though she had a little bit of trouble at the start, she was more or less loose. So when you see a horse at this level who's loose and then gets passed, even if it is Midnight Bisu, um, is is that discouraging for you, or or do you kind of look at the full picture and say, you know what, to me that's still a a, a power performance there? It's a little concerning, but you got a mile in a sixteenth race, and the horse went sub forty six for the half. I mean, loose, but had to use a ton to not only go to down to your nose, miss the break, and then have to rush up and go forty five just to get loose. I mean, I think you're just your energy disbursement is so off in a race like that. Whereas, I mean. Separation of powers, I believe. I mean, went 45 and a half in uh, her last race, in a seven furlong race, but in a mile of 16th, I mean, that's flying. I, I definitely, it's a concern if you're loose against, you know, a weaker field, I think. But I mean, the class of Midnight Bisu and the how much energy I had to use, I'm willing to excuse it in this case. Fair enough. Um, you want to mention the works here as well, too, right? Yeah, so I think the cut. That, the cutback and distance, I, I think one turn will ultimately be come dancing sweet spot. I also think um, when you look at the PPs, every time well, this horse won on debut, and every time this horse had a layoff line, the horse was won. Um, even there, there was even one time earlier where the horse had about two months off, um, ran a great race. I, I think you look at how well this one does fresh. You look at the times. I haven't had a chance to see the workout reports, which is another thing I do like to look out, but I don't think they'll come out till Friday night, just to double check how good the works actually were. But you see two works back. I mean, the best four for a long workout this horse has ever had. Um, I just And now you get Javier Castellano for the first time as well. I, I really like Manny Franco, but maybe Javier's the answer. I mean, he's obviously just Hall of Famer, unbelievable. So, I mean, I did so many things going versatile horse. I'm just really excited. Um, and I'm also hoping that, the price isn't hammered too bad because you have Carlos Martin as the trainer here and then separating his power, Jose Ortiz, Chad Brown. I'm hoping that one takes enough money to make 
either a double going into Chancelot or an, a pick six single, you know, worth it. Um, and maybe some even pick threes. I'm, I'm just hoping you get a little bit better because there's a Chad Brown and Jose Ortiz force that'll be fine for co-favoritism. And there is there is some some additional class in this field. Mia Mischief is one who's always honest. Uh, she'll be right there. And Christine, I know uh, just I'll kind of briefly, if you wanted to mention, I know that there's a horse on the outside with a bit of speed that you like to in a minute to start him. Um, what was the case uh, that, that you saw for that horse? Yeah, I think, you know, for the most part, I'm I'm in agreement with Scott. I mean, Come Dancing is going to be my top selection in the race. So if you're going to keep it kind of lean in this race, that's the way to go. But if you are maybe singling in other races as far as the sequences go and you're looking for that price, I think when you start to underestimate a horse that is undefeated in a certain scenario, that's where you are in kind of a dangerous spot is getting defeated by a horse at a big price. And for me, with Minute to Stardom and Jose Camejo, she's undefeated for him. Three races in a row. In his tutelage, she's won all three. We all overlooked her in the Honorable Miss, and she won it 20 to 1. Now, he has had a good year. He's won a lot of races. He's run 150-some-odd horses. He's 29% over the last 30 days. But I did pull just his numbers in, you know, these types of graded stakes events, a grade one event. He has not even run a horse in a grade one over the last five years. So it is somewhat of uncharted territories, but just one of those horses that if you are going deeper, you're looking for a bigger price, I would say don't underestimate her because so far she's answered every question put forth. I like it. And and we are looking for prices. <laughs> so uh, we'll take it where we can get a minute to start them. Uh, an intriguing possibility. Uh, of course, you know, when we talk about how this pace might unfold, um, it'll be interesting to see how they stack up and if minute to, minute to start them can put some pressure on come dancing. And, you know, uh, even when we look at separation of powers, uh, who's generally forwardly placed, is she going to have a trip similar uh, to the one she had last year um, in the uh, in the test when, when she went by uh, a couple of these horses. So um, we'll see how it unfolds. A very interesting race, small field. Uh, Scott and Christina both like come dancing for the win. If you want a little bit of value in here, uh, maybe take a look at Christina's minute to start them. All right, let's move on to race seven, the H. Allen Jerkins. They'll all be gunning for racing's newest sensation, a horse that we've mentioned already here, Chance a lot, a 12 and a half length winner of the Amsterdam in just his third career start. It seems like you'd have to regress considerably for anyone to beat him. Scott, you don't think that's going to happen. You think this is a mortal lock. Am I am I right? I mean, that's how, that's how I'm going to play. And it's a shame because I actually do like a few others in here, but it's just, you can't ignore that. I mean, if you watch the replay of the Amsterdam, I mean, that was just, one of those races where the only note I had was, whoa. <laughs> I mean, just made it look so easy, clear from the outside, and to win by that much in a grade two with, I mean, nothing spectacular in the race, but there were some good horses, and did it so easily. I mean, right from the start, using from the 12-hole, the but I mean, until at the end, which I think it was just for fun, I mean, the, the jockey was a statue. Mm-hmm. And that horse was doing everything on his own third lifetime start. I mean, the regression would have to be massive. Or somebody would have to jump way up as far as, you know, as far as the speed figures go, and we'll get to that. But, I mean, I just thought it was ultra impressive. I I mean, you're going 43 and change to the half and not stopping. Um, yeah, this is pretty spectacular. And, Yep. Granted, you're incredibly loose, but I mean, you're just, it's, that was one of the most unbelievable things that I've, I've seen, similar to kind of, I guess, Frosted's Met Mile was pretty spectacular back in whatever that was, 2015, but, or 2016, this was just, just crazy. I, I just think, I think even some of the, they just went, maybe wanted to see what a couple of taps on the whip would do, but I mean, obviously didn't need them. I mean, that was just, yeah, like I said, whoa. Um, things happen, horses bounce, but I mean, I think any one of the speed figures that this horse has run, I believe the 108 um, he ran last time would be second to only maybe Baracho's last race. As far as speed figures go, I mean, the 122 just skies over, over this field, and I... Uh, I look forward to maybe getting away with a single single. Um, also kind of was doing some testing and playing playing around with some Jorge Navarro angles and 
created one that was just um, I found kind of interesting. I mean, 47% wins when you when you have Jorge Navarro career best last race one turn. I, I kind of just did one mile or less. I mean, you could have even shrunk it down less, but I figured one turn was good enough. Um, so I, I just wanted it to be a one turn situation, and also with the highest late pace rating in the race. I mean, Jorge's horses are usually very forwardly placed, so if you give him a horse that freaks and has the highest late pace rating, I mean, a 47% win, 36 starts over the last year, success score of 7.8, which is, you know, quite good. And I'm not too worried about the ROI being low in this situation because not playing the horse to make a ton of money and playing the horse to get by with only using one horse in horizontals or create stuff underneath if you're a vertical player. Um, and I'm just super excited as a fan. I mean, it, it'll be a chalky double. I'm hoping because separation of powers will take some money that you might pay a little bit. I'll look into the pool. And if not, you know, I'll just start a couple pick threes and the pick six, a single single and see, see what happens. But I'm, I'm very excited to see this one run. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I like how in that back testing, you really, I mean, you essentially answer that question we started with, which is, you know, is there any expectation or reasonable expectation we might have that, that this horse might bounce or might regress in some capacity. And, and the search that you did right there answers the question at least half the time, uh, roughly. Um, you know, that's not the case. The horse actually wins, you know, next time out and, and an extremely high 47% strike rate. I mean, you just don't see that. Um, so that answers that question. A, a horse that you mentioned uh, just in passing is, is for me the one, if I'm going to play this horse, this race straight up, I'm going to potentially look at some of the exacta probables and and try to see if I can if I can hit a nice cold exacta chance a lot over another horse and the one that I landed on is is the four horse Baracho uh, who you mentioned again a moment ago he's been a different horse since was being tried at seven furlongs the fact that he's run three strong races at the distance you can see the Equibase speed figures 103 105 and 111 they, they're all ascending Equibase speed figures at three different race tracks too. Um, that's further proof that he's coming to his own. Um, the replay to watch, if we just want to pull it up briefly, is the is the Woody Stevens, and um, you know we could kind of skip ahead a little bit. Uh, he's the uh, he's the three horse uh, in this race, and uh, you know just coming off the turn, I, I mean like the pace was extremely hot in this race. The top three finishers all came from from well off the pace, and and he, and he's toward the back there. Um, but he ends up uh, running uh, into a bunch of trouble. People remember, you know, they'll look at this race and say, oh, mind control was the horse that, that had to take up and, and, and you might want to bet back. For me, it was Baracho uh, because Baracho almost, you know, essentially had, had a gap closed on him once mind control takes up. And so um, the box is really small here. You could see him, uh, Jock is in, the, uh, is in the red silks on the rail. He's He's basically third from last right now, and he's about to come around horses and make a move here. Um, and you'll see when uh, when mind control uh, gets, uh, you know, here comes uh, Hog Creek Hustle over, and then there you go, that move right there. So now uh, Baracho has to wait for that hole to open up. It opens up, here he comes again, but then here comes Nitrous on the outside um, and kind of leaning, him, leaning in on him a little bit. And again, preventing him from going through, you see he goes ducks back inside of Hog Creek Hustle to try to find some running room. So two times there, he was shut off and uh, he still ran on extremely well, had plenty in the tank. And then the way he came back and made easy work of a nice allowance field last out at Saratoga does inspire confidence in his ability at this distance and over this track. So for me, um, you know, if we could get a decent exacta on Chancelot over Baracho, that's the way to go because I'm envisioning a situation similar to what we saw in the Amsterdam where there's this all out scramble for, for the play spot. And uh, I think that Baracho is the best of the rest. Um, Christina, I know you are essentially on board with chance a lot. Anything else you wanted to add in, in this race? I'm definitely on board. I mean, you know, TBG was there at Monmouth a couple starts back when he won the non-one. And Jorge Navarro is always very confident, but he was the first to say this was the best sprinter he ever had his hands on. And so you, know, you think of the horses that he has had and for him to say something like that. So we were expecting something exciting in the Amsterdam, and he did not disappoint. So I think you have the right strategy just in trying to find that horse to put underneath. Uh, for me, I think Hog Creek Hustle is improving right now. So if I'm going to play – the race that way he'd probably be the one that I would go for he's to the outside uh there so perhaps that's the one underneath but 
definitely all in on Chance a lot and just sort of looking forward, as I said, to start the show here as a fan to see what he can do again. Absolutely. Let's move on to race eight, the Boston Spa, one of the most wide open races of the day, which could potentially make it one of the better betting races of the day. How wide open is it? Well, secret message for Grand Motion is the favorite at morning line odds of three to one. Christina, I know uh, that uh, this horse is is the one that you've had your eyes on. You've got a couple of uh, interesting items to point out, so I'll let you let you get to it. Yeah, I do think she is the horse to be, and she had all kinds of trouble in the Diana last time out. We can pull that replay up for you. She's going to end up fourth across the wire, but we can really just take it up from the quarter pole home because she kind of sat that tracking trip in behind that she likes. This is where she wants to be, and things were seemingly going very well for her at that point. And she's going to be in the teal silk kind of uh, second from the back on this occasion. She'll actually run in the burgundy and gold coming up this weekend, but uh, with the partners, but she's in the teal in the back there. And just as she's sort of mounting her run, you're going to see she's going to be completely stopped here. A couple horses coming off the turn, going to all kind of gravitate towards the rail as the two was kind of coming over, and she just gets stopped cold. She looks like a very big filly to me, a daughter of Hattrick, and I think when you stop a horse like that with their momentum, it's really hard for them to get that going again. So I do see her with a clear trip as the horse to be, and Grand Motion's had one of his best seasons at Saratoga in a while, and I was realizing that just kind of as we've watched the races week by week and day by day and, and seeing him pick up those wins, but I pulled – just his record at Saratoga over the last three years. And this is, as I said, you know, one of the best seasons he's had. He last year, I believe, only won one, maybe two races a couple years ago that was only able to pick up four races throughout the season. So you can kind of filter through and, and see for yourself there. But that with the eight winners that he's had thus far, you know, this is a barn that is calling all the right shots and it tends to go that way. You know, when you're consistent, out there in the afternoons and in the mornings, the, the pattern kind of tends to continue itself. So secret message, I, I do think, is the horse to beat. But in watching the replays, there was one other horse that I was very intrigued by. And, and so I think for me, the bet, because I think secret message is going to be your favorite, the bet is Masha, the French bread, to the far outside. She's the nine for Chad Brown. Uh, she's had one start here, stateside, since coming over from France. But she was away for nearly a year into that allowance race back on July the 31st, and Iron Ortiz did not touch her as they turned for home. She was a length clear. She probably could have won that race by six lengths if she wanted to. It's a big step up, but I'm not underestimating the talent that I, she showed. And of, of all the replays, of all of the you know horses that the first turn of foot goes in this race, Masha is the one for me. So she'll be the horse that I bet. Hopefully we'll get that nine to two on her. I agree with you. Visually impressive. Uh, and she could have won by more. Um, this actually kind of reminds me to ask a question that um, comes into play a lot on days like this, especially when we're talking about these turf races where you have Chad Brown sending out horses, you know, first time stateside or second time stateside in stakes races. Um, second time Lasix as well. Um, do you, uh, Christine, I, I take it from, from your take on Masha that you don't expect, uh, you know, major regression. Uh, I, I wonder, Scott, do you uh, second time Lasix, second time U.S., uh, or do, does that do you hold that potentially as a concern, or, or does it vary for you by trainer? Um, I would just, yeah, I guess it would depend on the trainer. Chad Brown, I, I just trust too much. I mean, if this one's entered in here, it's, it's for a reason. He usually picks his races in pairs, and I, I just think this is probably was the target. And like you said, could have won by more. It'll be interesting to see how much. But I would expect improvement in this spot. Yep. All right. Um, so there we have it. Secret message topic. That's my topic as well. Um, and, you know, Masha, I think, uh, is certainly a danger. I also like on secret message that, you know, Jose, Jose, Jose Ortiz is up for, for grand motion. Could have presumably landed on, on, on one of two or three other horses in this race. Uh, but but takes this mount here and uh, inspires additional confidence. So, um Let's move on to race nine. We're a few races away now from the Traverse. Um, this one will kind of do quick style. Um, it's pretty much uh, most people are either Midnight Bisu or Elate. Uh, I'll kick it back to Christina for a quick opinion on this one. What do you think? 
Okay, I'm going to go team late in here, Dan. Uh, I love what I've seen from her in her last couple of starts. Uh, I like how Bill Mott you know, has goals and how horses tend to improve throughout a campaign. And she's won twice since that little layoff. So if you're, you know, projecting that she keeps getting better, then, you know, who knows how good she could be by the time we get to the end of the year and by the time we get to the Breeders' Cup. I just see this, the star of Medaglia Doro, and that's another, you know, thing. His offspring, I think, get better with age. So I'm going to look to her. And on the, you know, supporting side of that is just the fact that even though Midnight Bizu was a winner in the Molly Pitcher last out, I just thought it was a little bit workmanlike. I wanted to see a little more from her. And if you're looking at you know, any of the speed figures, you can see that she did regress a little bit. Now she still won. So, you know, all she can do is go ahead and pass the horses that are in front of her. But visually, it wasn't the most pleasing race to me. And I also just going into that race, just kind of wondered, you know, you have the race between the eighth and the Ogden fifth. You knew this was the next goal. And, and maybe she did need another start in between because she does seem to be just tough as nails. But, you know, that was a, a grade three. The purse wasn't huge. And she didn't look 100% sparkling to me so I think she's a little vulnerable coming up on Saturday and that's why in part I'm going to go with a late all right Scott um breaks my heart but I'm kind of in the same boat I, I think so I think if this race is a mile and a quarter I'd be for sure late if this is a mile and a 16th I'd be for sure midnight BC I think this is going to be a bit of a throwdown because we've got the in between um mile and an eighth I, I just I'm leaning a late because I think when you get past a mile and a sixteenth, then Ibisu is just not as good. I think that a, a late's proven a couple times winning at this distance, has a win at Saratoga. Midnight Bisu has not won at the distance, has not won at Saratoga, and just it breaks my heart. I, I'm going to use them both, but I'm going to lean a late in this spot, um, and it's mostly because of distance and a little bit. Seems a little bit more more fresh and in uh, at the top of her game at this point. Well, we love that you're a horse player, but you still have a heart, and you and you, and you think with <laughs> think with your mind still. So you let that dictate your plays, though. But that you could still love these horses. And Midnight Bizu, of course, a great story, easy to root for. Um, but as you mentioned, 0 for three at the distance, 0 for two at Saratoga, um, and and there's reason. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is a this is a tougher spot. And she's been in um, her last couple of races. And even though she she, she beat a late earlier in the season, um, I, I think we all know that was a different a late. And again, that was at a mile and a 16th. So um, I think we have consensus here on a late uh, being the one of the personal ensign. Um, let's jump ahead to the sword dancer, race 10, Chad Brown. What do you know? Has three runners in here. Yeah, Primo, Annals of Time, Proven Reserves. And he looks to pick up his third sword dancer victory, which would actually tie him with Bill Mott for the most wins in the race by a trainer. Christina, you landed on one of the Chads. Um, I think we're on the same page here as well. Tell us who and why. I landed on the seven annals of time in here for Chad Brown. And uh, I've been a big fan of this horse for a very long time. And I feel like time has really flown because I remember watching him win the Hollywood Derby. I was working that day all the way back in 2016 and I knew he had spent some time on the sidelines but I just didn't realize he was six years old now and you know here we are but I feel like he's coming back to himself and to that raw talent that we saw as a three-year-old and perhaps sitting on a, a big race coming up this weekend and you just look at what you know Chad Brown has been able to do with a horse like Brixton Mortar when you give them you know serious time off when they are recovering from something you know that requires that time they do come back at that same level for him pretty often. And so I think that's what you're going to see with this horse. The stat that I pulled was from trainer Chad Brown, third off the layoff over the last two years, and specifically when he's running in stakes races. And he hits at a high percentage you know, in a lot of different categories. But I think when you're kind of filtering it and just talking about stakes races, you really do have to – be willing to accept that that you know 16 17 18 19 percent is very very good because this is the premier level and as you can see he is very very high in this circumstance and you would generally assume that and know that all we had to do is watch the racing at arlington last weekend but i think annals of time is a horse that's sitting on a big race i love the effort in the non-three which i mean it can be hard to even get a race 
in that level to go. But he was a four and a half length winner back on July 24th. He's come back with some really good work. And he's a horse that has that sort of explosive turn of foot from off the pace. So hopefully he'll get something to run at. You know, I know that we're probably going to see Channel Cat at Yapsimo and the others kind of up and involved early again. But the uh, Annals of Time is the horse for me. I, I, I think Channel Cat of the horses that have faced each other is the best one. And he showed a lot of tenacity and was able to fight off all challengers in the Bowling Green last out. But I'm looking for a fresh face in here. And the fresh face for me is the seven. Yeah, I like I like the direction you're going. Um, you mentioned your primo actually as well here. This is another one uh, making uh, his second U.S. start off a huge effort. Channel Cat was loose uh, in that Bowling Green, and uh, yeah, primo looked like uh, he was going to go by it at at one point there late, but Channel Cat had just enough in reserve uh, to to hold him off. It'd be interesting to see if Channel Cat is able to set a pace again like that. Um, I don't think that will happen again. I, I do think that uh, specifically the horse out on the rail proven reserves uh, might be one who, who's who been entered here to, uh, to to keep the pace honest up front. Um, I don't know the proven reserves can win, but, but I think, um, you know, again, we're going a mile and a half, but he'll at least uh, keep the pace honest. Uh, before we move on to the big one, uh, Scott, anything jump out at you here in the Sword Dancer? Well, it seems, it, I agree. It seems like the answer to proven reserve is a rabbit. I mean, there's nothing to suggest this horse wants turf, belongs at this level, belongs at this distance. I, I don't understand at all. It seems like overkill because I think Tis Morning is going to have to try to do the same thing, right? I mean, I don't know. It just seems like a Chad Brown overkill or, you know, a move just to make sure that it sets up for the closers. But I think you guys hit it. I mean, Annals of Time, I, I been very excited and I also remember that that Hollywood Derby and um, I was playing a tournament back then and beating Beach Patrol was just I thought it was just a great effort and obviously everything that happened in between but rounding into the form I'll be excited to see how you know how high this one can go and yeah Primo I mean always dangerous with that kind of figure and second second in and I'll, I'll probably use a couple others I, I mean I think channel I'm not I don't want to get beat by channel maker um, or really Sadler's Joy. I mean, I'll, I'll probably spread in here because I'll be so thin in others, but I mean, I'm most looking forward to Annals of Time third off the layoff after being off for so long. Absolutely. A couple of those cagey veterans you mentioned on the outside. Sadler's Joy, still uh, still doing it um, and, and actually uh, could, could be rounding into form. That's another one that we should, uh, you know, we should at least mention uh, for people uh, who are looking to start forming those tickets. Uh, Sadler's Joy, always an honest runner. So, um, with that, let's move on to the big one, the Traverse, the grade one, run happy Traverse, uh, $1.25 million, um, and this is it. Uh, th th this is what's left of, uh, this is sort of the, the best of the rest here from the three-year-old field. Of course, Maximum Security won't be here. Omaha Beach has been out for a while and will be out for a little while longer. So, um, you know, here we are with essentially the storyline being Tacitus, uh looks to be appears to be um you know at the, at the top of this field uh, you've also got code of honor uh but you know let's just start out with tacitus um has found a way to lose uh two races that that i think you know if you ask anybody uh he should have won uh the belmont as well losing that race by a length and then the jim dandy of course um losing that by less than a length and so Scott, uh, I know you've got a couple of opinions on Tacitus, so I'll let you kick us off here. Yeah, he owes me a lot of money, and uh, Bill Mott has not gotten <laughs> back to me on that. Um, ruined some monster days, but I mean, I guess it's starting to be concerning. I mean, I still think the best horse in this field, but I mean, anytime a horse finds trouble as often as this one does, I mean, you have a major concern. Um, I just think everyone is going to see that that trip um in the gym dandy and you can you really only need to see the start and then how close it got at the end but i mean just took all chances out i just could not believe the start you're going to see on the outside almost falls all the way down and you spot a short field that many lengths i mean it was impressive really impressive how much uh he overcame in the end and um just now we're adding blinkers to try to solve that horse has never been in blinkers you'll touch on a stat um 
about blinkers and Bill Mott, but I mean, there's concerns. I mean, I'm the three year olds have just been tough this year. I, I thought the name King for a day was perfect because that's about what all of them had been. And now you've got, you've just got a number of different courses and waiting for one to break out. I can't wait to see Omaha beach. I was also really hoping game winner would show up in the spot. Neither of those happened. So, um, yeah, for half of this, we'll <laughs> reluctantly be my top pick, but there is no way I'm singling this time. Um, there's just, there's a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff in here and we'll, we'll see if the blinkers, I mean, if the source ever focuses, I think you could see a freak performance at some point. I'm just, I'm just not sure where it's going to be, but I, the horse will run all day and even, I mean, tried to win that race. I mean, second by less than a length. Um, after that start was pretty incredible, but I mean, everyone's going to see that and, you know, it's going to be the wise guy horse of the, of the year. I mean, with people telling you about that and how, how short the odds are, we'll see um, how much real money comes in, but man, um, not singling, but reluctantly making my top pick, but there are others I'd like to do a little touch on later. And, and as we're looking at Tacitus, uh, I'm just going to point out for people who aren't familiar with the uh, Stat Race Lens interface, uh, just real briefly, near the comment lines um, is where you see there, there are these little red up triangles. That means that the horse had trip trouble. Uh, it's the trouble indicator on Stats Race Lens. Um, you'd notice it a couple of times here with Tacitus. Uh, what is that, three out of the last four races? So, And then, and then you know, as, as a handicapper, you ask yourself, um, you know, is it just bad luck or is it just the horse? I mean, will, will, will the horse find a way to not break alertly or will somehow find trouble at some point during the race? So those are concerns for me. You mentioned the Bill Mott blinker, blinkers on angle, uh, which we have here to pull up uh, briefly. Just a quick search here. Pull up these numbers in graded stakes. Bill Mott adding blinkers for the first time. Seven starts, just one win. And that win was with Amaliant. Remember Amaliant? 2014 so it's been five years since he, he's pulled off this move successfully um certainly doesn't uh sort of boost uh the confidence uh if you're already having uh, questions or doubts about tacitus uh christina you wanted to make i think a point on the other who will probably go up the horse will go off as the co-favorite here that's code of honor but before you do uh, just just brief thoughts on tacitus and and how and how you view him in this race yeah, I'm I'm right there with you guys. I mean, I just think he's not very genuine. He has all of the talent in the world, but like you say, finds trouble. So for me, uh, he's not going to be, you know, he'd be a horse I would include, but it's a defensive choice. It's not a horse that I want to choose on top or have a lot of faith in. And then just sort of overall, as far as a couple other horses, I think highest honors is going to be over bet a little bit. I think, as you say, taxes will be over bet. I think Highest Honors is a horse that has all of the tools to be a, a star down the road, but I think this is a lot, and they're throwing a lot at him to go into the Travers, you know, off of three starts under his belt thus far. I'm going to look at Code of Honor to his inside, and this is a horse that I've followed for a very long time. I chose him as my top selection before the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, which he never competed in. Shrug McGay, he scratched him the week of that race. And then I was in South Florida when he ran in the Fountain of Youth and when he ran in the Florida Derby. And in all that time, the concern for him was always his weight. And was he able to carry enough weight and keep that weight on? And was he sort of bouncing back out of these races and out of these works in good order? And it seemed like everything was kind of knocking him back a little bit more than Shug McGay he wanted. I think he's growing up now. And I think if you look at his performance in the Dwyer, he was, you know, flagged just once by Johnny B. You heard Larry Coleman say, oh, he's back in style. And I think he is. And I also have faith in him at, at these distances. Uh, his dam reunited. She was more of a sprinter. But you look at the way that he runs and you hope he gets, you know, some of that stamina influence from the top side. And I also just checked the late pace just to, because I was curious about it as far as the closers go on the two rod stage. If you filter it by late pace, that he is second fastest as far as those closing. Owen oh, Delta is inside. But will also be running late. I think he might drop back just even a little bit further. So I give him a lot of respect. But for me, Code of Honor was the horse that I'm going to end up taking on top. But aside from Tacitus, Dan, the horse I'm most afraid of is actually Mucho Gusto. And I think everybody, you know, for the most part agrees that maximum security with that win in the Haskell kind of put himself back on top and back very squarely 
in the picture here as far as the best three-year-old that we're still dealing with. And we will not see him this weekend. But Mucho Gusto showed me a lot in that race and in defeat. And one of the things that I have followed for a very long time is just Bob Baffert. And I talk about patterns and regressions and bounces. And he's not a trainer whose horses can subscribe to those traditional theories because he just trains them for fitness. They are battle tested in the mornings and they come back for more each and every time. So I think that the Mucho Gusto we're going to see this weekend is sort of going to be bigger, better, stronger than the one that was second in the half school last out. And if you pull the stats on Bob Baffert, just talking about uh, him coming back with a horse off their best echo based speed figure in their last particular performance, uh, he's right up there, 32%. And if you filter it in stakes races, it's just as high. It's not, you know, one or 2% lower. So very, very strong angle for Baffert. I think Mitchell Gooster improves. He has been you know, thrown a lot as far as the shipping goes, the Monmouth in that heat, back to California to work, now back to the East Coast, had all that rain the last couple of days. So I'm still going to pick Code of Honor, but I'm most afraid of Mucho Gusto over Tassadis. I think Mucho Gusto uh, is your co-third choice uh, on the morning line, at least, with Owendale and uh, Tax. And uh, I think of those, as, as you kind of alluded to there, might be getting overlooked here a bit, not necessarily a buzz horse at the moment. Uh, but, you know, when you consider uh, he hung in as well as he did last out. Um, the only question for me with him would be, and, and you know, I don't know if, if you guys subscribe to this, but, you know, when, when you run a race that big and you still get turned away, you know, do you get discouraged? Um, or do you come back and, and, and really just, just fire your A race again? Um, so that's something to consider. You know, one thing, and we looked at the, the, the on the true odds page, that there's a pace projector there that, that essentially said that um, we can go back to it. You know, it, it's not making an, any strong predictions at the moment about about how fast they're going. But when I look at this race, um, and this has Mucho Gusto on the lead, I actually think it's going to be a different horse on the lead. And, and I don't think the pace is going to be overly hot. The only horses, I think, amongst the known commodities here who are generally forwardly placed are Mucho Gusto and tax, but they arguably have run their best races when they're just off the pace. And so the only other horse here who has the natural speed to get there and may have a strategic purpose in getting there is looking at bikinis. Um, I think he makes sense uh, with Javier Castellano up as a horse who's just going to go out and and try to see, you know, uh, basically how fast he can go early. Um, we could take a look at the replay of the curl in here. Um, and really what I'm interested in more than anything is, is just pointing out that uh, looking at bikinis gets to the lead, um, is there uh, for a, about half the race, and then things just get a little weird. Um, it, it really is a bizarre race. He sets the pace, uh, looked like he was fading, and then somehow kicks on to finish a re-rallying third. Um, to me, what it says, and, and you can see looking at bikinis there now, the three on the rail, you're going to see, I mean, once he's headed, uh, it looks like he's backing up and, and he's done. Um, but then just keep your eye on him. Watch watch how he re-rallies. To me, um, th that's the sign of a horse who's still figuring things out and who still has some upside. Um, you know, no idea where that ceiling is. Uh, but at the very least, I think he should get to the front here and set a much slower pace going longer, of course, this time. Um, and, you know, we'll see how far he can go. So I, I, the move is, it, I think we're about to see it. You're about to see a couple of horses go by. Um, and, and again, it's going to look like looking, bikini, looking at bikinis is done and, and about to pack it in. But, but the re-rally on the rail um, was something that kind of opened my eyes uh, in watching this replay. And it also opens my eyes because the horse only run three times. And, and as I said, still figuring things out. Um, Javier Castellano staying aboard is an encouraging sign. So right here, right? I mean, the horse has passed, um, but then just just digs in and 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 keeps moving. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned highest honors. Um, yes, uh, highest honors. Uh, you know, wins here. But 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 the horse that I take out of this race after after setting those really really quick early fractions is going to be looking at bikinis, and we'll see how far he can go on the lead. So um, that's uh, that's the play there. Also, his best effort came over a fast track, 
when he posted that 102 Equibase speed figure uh, breaking his maiden. The two other races were over um, wet surfaces. So uh, assuming uh, it stays dry on Saturday, he's one that's, that's interesting to me and going to be a price. Uh, Scott, I know you've got your eye um, on at least one horse who could be a price here. A couple of others might, might be a mid-range price. You want to start with, with Owen Dale and, and tell us what you like about him? Sure. Um, I think you just have you have an improving horse. Um, and if you look at the, the PPs on Owen Dale, every time this horse has had, um, I guess two in particular, um, between – a couple races, optional claimers early, and then between the Risen Star and the Lexington, every time the horse has had a couple months or you know, seven, eight weeks to, between starts, kind of like the two months that he's been off now, he's just run a very improved race, um, jumping up by significant points on the figures, ran what I would consider probably the best race he's ever ran in the last in the Ohio Derby. Now, what he beat was questionable, but ever since um, Florent Giroux has taken over this horse, the horse just keeps getting better. He's getting his best out of him, and I, I just think he's he's the type that's improving. And then um, I kind of created an angle with Brad Cox here. First off, the layoff of 45 days or more graded stakes on dirt. Um, he's, I mean, you only have 11 starts in the last year, but, I mean, three firsts, three seconds. Um, success or 7-7 and the ROI is pretty high at 99% because um, he's done it with a few prices and I, I just think you've, you've got a chance for Owendale to be a little overlooked in the betting. I'm hoping you get more than 6-1 to one just because I think there's just a lot of ways to go in here and the three-year-olds have been so disappointing and so inconsistent that I, I just think you could see there's going to be a couple that are going to float up. I'm not great at predicting that type of thing but I, I'm hoping Owendale is one of them and um, it's one that I'm definitely he's he's one that I'm definitely going to use and looking forward to see if he can you know maybe run another uh, career best race here. Yep, I, I'm actually with you on Owendale. I mean, it hasn't run a bad race going back to February. Um, you know, he, he he's just been lo looks like he's getting better with each race. I think Christina pointed out, you know, that that sort of the horse figuring it out, code of honor being a horse that's figuring it out and and who's you know potentially ready to take that next step. I I'd put Owendale in that class as well. Um, and, you know, question for me with him is, you know, will he be able to stay in touch with the field uh, early on so that he doesn't have so much to do late as, as he has on a number of occasions? Uh, and I think he should, uh, it, because as I said, I don't see this being uh, a race that, that, that projects to, to be, you know, uh, have an overly hot pace. And so um, I, I certainly would include Owendale uh, in my selections. And with that, I mean, let's let's just kick it around real quick, and and why don't uh, we all just kind of recap our top three selections? Christina, let's start with you. I'm gonna put the Code of Honor on top. I'll probably be on the Mucho Gusto bandwagon as far as my second selection, and then you guys have sort of sold me on Owendale over the last couple of minutes, so I'll, I'll I'll put him in third. Scott. Um, I reluctantly will put Tacitus on top. Owendale would be my second choice, and I'm still torn. I have distance concerns about a lot of the others. I My heart's a little bit more with tax, um, and it, it's interesting. Another pace angle here is that after the draw, Danny Gargan was quoted as saying, though, that, that kind of forced our hand, and they're going to send tax on the outside. Whether that means they're going to send him the lead or he's going to be really close, or they just want to do that to see if, Maybe somebody else won't go for the lead if they declare that they're going for the lead. I don't know what the exact reason is, but, I mean, you don't have too many options from being that far outside. So I don't like the draw for him, but at least I know he will be involved early and they won't be playing any games. So that, it gives me a little bit of hope there. But, um, yeah, so we're, I'm, I'm still kind of deciding that third choice between Tax and Bucha Gusto, Code of Honor, but um, we'll say Tax for now. All right, yeah, and Tax is a bit of a wild card. We'll see um, how he impacts – their early pace, if he if, if looking at bikinis does indeed go, and if Tax tries to hang with them, um, you know, I, I think you could throw out everything I said about looking at bikinis. But for now, I think looking at bikinis um, with with the better draw, I mean, he's not drawn that far inside, but with the better draw, I think gets to the lead. I look for Javier to establish some daylight between himself and some of the other horses, even Tax, who I would imagine would, you know, even if he clears, may just sit just off of him. Um, I'm going to go with looking at bikinis on top. And then underneath, I'm going to use Owendale, Code of Honor, and Endorsed. 
Um, so is Saturday the day to bet Tacitus? Maybe. This will be the first time I'm not betting on Tacitus. So um, take that for what it's worth. Um, Want to mention again, Stats Race Lens. We've only scratched the surface here showing you some of the features on Stats Race Lens. You've seen some of the, um, you know, some of the angles that you can store, uh, some of the back testing, just the, the, the true odds projector and how simple and easy it is to pull up quick data. So uh, if you're interested in Stats Race Lens, for a short time now, uh, for the next couple of days, uh, get on, take advantage of this Traverse promo. You'll get 30% off any package, equibase.com. Pull up the package you want and enter promo code Traverse30. So with that, we will uh, close out for this Traverse Stakes edition of Handicapping with Stats Race Lens. want to thank everyone uh, who's made the show go here. Of course, thank you as well to TVG's Christina Blacker and the champ, the NHC champ, Scott Coles, for doing it again here on Stats Race Lens. We wish everyone the best of luck on Saturday.